uh, with regard uh, to the treatment of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, there have been a number of different uh, advances over the years. Um, I think uh, one of the important concepts to have is that not everybody who is diagnosed with Waldenstrom's need to be treated immediately after the diagnosis. Um, there are a number of patients who are going to be asymptomatic, and uh, those patients are better off uh, not being treated as they can enjoy actually years, uh, in some cases decades of, of life uh, without the actual need of being treated. Since Waldenstrom's is an incurable disease uh, and patients have a very long survival, we tend to treat patients specifically when they are having some symptoms that are affecting the patient's quality of life. When we get to that point, uh, most patients typically are anemic. Uh, they feel tired, they're fatigued because of the anemia. Some other patients can have other symptoms. Uh, some patients can have hyperviscosity, for example. The thickening of the blood is very high, and that affects uh, how they function. They cause, it can cause um, headaches and nosebleeds, and some uh, blurred vision and affect the retinas, uh, the circulation in the retinas. Uh, some patients can have nerve ending damage as well. So there's a number of different ways in which Waldenstrom can affect patients, and those patients are the patients who will benefit from treatments as our treatments are, are currently palliative. Now, um, there are a number of different combinations of, of agents that we have been using over the last few years. And uh, I would say largely you can divide treatments in, in three different uh, groups. I would say uh, the chemotherapy, the chemoimmunotherapy group of treatments uh, that essentially are alkylating agents. And we have agents like cyclophosphamide or bendamustine that we use in combination with rituximab, which is an antibody against CD20. We also have a group of uh, medications called protosome inhibitors, and we have a number of them uh, available in the United States, uh, bortezomib, carfilzomib, ixazomib, and they also can be combined uh, with rituximab and, and produce really nice responses. And most recently, we have the uh, bruton tarosin kinase inhibitors, or BTK inhibitors, specifically ibrutinib, which actually is the only FDA medication approved for the treatment of patients with Waldenstrom's. So how we select, right, in, in, how to choose chemotherapy, how to choose protosome inhibitors or BTK inhibitors with or without rituximab is, is uh, it's a bit of science, a bit of art. Um, so we essentially, um, at least in, in my practice, uh, we try to personalize and uh, look at the patient's age, look at the patient's uh, comorbidities, look at the patient's symptoms. We also look at the patient's uh, genomic profile. There are some uh, specific uh, genomic changes or abnormalities in the patient's malignant cells that can make them more um, or less uh, prone to respond to specific treatments, for example. Um, so we have all those uh, issues in, in, in mind when we try to make uh, treatment recommendations, but along, along the board, I would say, all these treatments have very similar uh, efficacy, uh, meaning response rates over 90%, uh, major response rates, which is a decrease in the IgM of about 50%, anywhere between you know, 60 and 70 percent in very deep responses, meaning at least a 90 percent decrease in the IgM or, or lower of approximately 20 to 30 percent. So all these agents provide similar benefits. Uh, the, the way we look at this is you know, how the toxicity sometimes of these agents can affect patients in a specific situations, and, and we make decisions based on you know, having all those pieces of information at hand.